Ever ask what happened to the impact of Greek rule and culture in the steppe of Central Asia, the heights of the Hindu Kush and the Pamirs, and the banks of the Indus River since the death of Alexander? What if you discovered that the successor states of the region rivaled and may have surpassed those in the West? Join me for a special edition of Musical Masterworks with world-renowned historian and numismatist Osman Bopariachi for an in-depth look at the legacy of Alexander the Great in Central Asia, Bactria, and India. All that is next on Musical Masterworks Special Edition. Musical Masterworks, a program dedicated to the rediscovery of great symphonic, instrumental, choral, operatic, cinematic, and electronic compositions from antiquity to the present, with your host, Mike Stratus. Welcome. This is Mike Stratus, Musical Masterworks. Tonight we have a very special program, one that I've been waiting for a while to really get to the point and do it, and here it is. It is such a great pleasure. We have as our guest tonight here at Musical Masterworks Special Edition, and I also do want to say that when I say we, I want to also mention that on the line also listening right now is Esmeralda Marikas, my usual co-host on this. I do have the great fortune of having Osman Bopariachi, who is a numismatist, a historian, and archaeologist. For those of you wondering who is Professor Bopariachi, well, he graduated from the University of Kelaniya in Sri Lanka and attained postgraduate degrees with honors from the Sorbonne in Paris. He's the adjunct professor of Central and South Asian Art, Archaeology, and Numismatics at the University of California, Berkeley, and Emeritus Director of Research of the French National Center for Scientific Research, and former visiting professor and member of the Doctoral School of the Sorbonne. He currently serves as the director of the Sri Lanka French Archaeological Mission and also has launched a joint project with the Department of Near Eastern Studies of the University of California at Berkeley, focusing on Sri Lanka's role in ancient maritime trade in the Indian Ocean. He has authored 12 books, edited six books, published 162 research articles in reputed international journals. He has read 91 papers at international colloquia, presented 275 conferences in 80 cities, and he's carried out 120 archaeological missions in 24 different countries. His recently published book is When West Met East, Gandharan Art Revisited, and at present, he is working on a new catalog of Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek coins. Now, without further ado, I want to welcome Professor Bopariachi. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm very happy to be with you, Mike. Yeah. I'm ecstatic. I'm ecstatic to have you here. Um, for those of you listening, we are looking at the legacy of Alexander the Great on the region itself, and I speak of Central Asia, Bactria, and India. So, Professor, what impact did Alexander and Hellenism have on this region? Um, it's very interesting to know, first of all, that Alexander was in India. When we call India, it's really the Indus Valley. And right. you know, Alexander came to conquer the Achaemenid Empire, and he did it. And so he was in, in I mean, Central Asia and India between 329 and 326. And as all of us know, he died on, the, on June 10th, 323 BC. Right. But the history doesn't end there. I mean, Alexander died, but the Hellenism and the Greek presence in India continued until for another um, until 20 uh, AD, the Common Era. So right. the long story of the heritage of Alexander continued with 48 Greek kings who were ruling in this area. So that's the first thing we have to take uh, take into account. And the other thing is that uh, before the coming of Alexander, Aramaic was the lingua franca of the area. But after Alexander, the Greek became the language. Uh, yeah. If you look at the coins, you have the Greek legend. And even after the decline of the Greek power, the Greek was used by the Scythians, Parthians, and even the Kushans. That's amazing. That yeah. is truly a fascinating fact that we've replaced the Aramaic lingua franca yeah. with Greek, but and it remained until, if I'm not, you said 20 AD. That is quite even. Cool. Even after, even wow. after, even uh, only Kanishka changed it. That is 127 CE of the right. But if you even look at the inscriptions, uh, there are so many Greek inscriptions found in the gymnasium of Iconum in Afghanistan, the Greek city, and also in Kandahar in Afghanistan, and to what extent even some of the edicts of Ashoka, the emperor who became a Buddhist, and he 
had three languages on one of his inscriptions. One is Greek. So it wow. shows that, I mean, uh, the Greek was the dominant language for more than 300 years in these areas. And That's also true. the long lasting thing is the Greek city planning, the grid system, uh, the epidomia. Uh, epidomia is, was very popular in India. When you look at some of the archaeological sites like Taxila uh, and also Aishatra, Allahabad, uh, this is long time even after the presence of Greeks in India. They continued with the same type of Greek city planning. That um, is quite I'm, amazing. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. I'm sure hey, we'll be talking about more, but this <laughs> <laughs> this is something. And also, um, um, uh, most important thing is that the Greek introduced the dice truck coinage. That means right. in two dice and putting right. the portrait of the king and also the name of the king. This is yes. this was completely unknown to the Indians. Indians had what we call the punch mark coins. That means there's single punch, a symbol. But when the Greeks came in, they introduced the classical uh, dice truck coinage, and it lasted even until today. Well, Professor, if I may ask, since we are talking about coinage, and we'll get to a little more about it, but did any other peoples around the Greek and Indian world have any coinage that was similar to the Greek style, or were they all basically like the Indian pre-Alexander period coin? Um, no, they are all, I mean, of course, you have the Achaemenid coinage, uh, right. With, with the, of course, great the Persian. Type. Yeah, but the reverse doesn't have any type, right? So it's only right. one sided, and there is no legend on it. Wow, that that that's a little lot. If I may, Professor, we talked about the the post Alexander period, and I guess a lot of that is really the great achievement of the successors, what we call in Greek the Diadochi or the Diadochoi in, in ancient Greek. Yeah. And, and how did they approach the native population and their policies? Um, it's very interesting. You know, I mean, the Greeks were Greeks. I mean, they, they, I mean, they, had, their, they had their culture. But, you know, they made a wonderful effort uh, when they crossed the Hindukush mountains. Hindukush, well, I mean, Hindukush range, which is about 800 kilometers long, going up to about... Right thousand meters high, that means 25,000 feet. That was a barrier separating Bactria from India. Once right. you cross the Indukush, you come to India. So the, what these Greek kings did, they started right. the bilingual coinage. So on one side, you have the Greek legend, and you have almost the exact translation in a language we call right. Gandhari or Prakrit, and uh, written in Karoshti or Brahmi script. So this is how the first approach to the Indian civilization. So they, they talk to them, and with their types, in a language, which is commonly used in India. Yeah. And also from time to time, you know, I'm sure Mike, you know about it, the first depictions of Balarama Samkarshana and Vasudeva Krishna, these are, I mean, related to uh, Krishna or Vishnu. Right. Uh, these images were first struck by the Greeks, a, 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 a king called Lagathocles, who ruled yes. around 170 BC. And also there are many other gods like Lakshmi and others. Uh, we can talk for a long time. Yes, those are beautiful. Beautiful statuary that uh, really plays a big role in, in the transitional uh, aesthetic That's that uh, I have seen. And you've done a wonderful job presenting that as well. Uh, I guess before we get to the coins, um, there are some questions that need to be asked in terms of the longevity of these kingdoms. Yeah. The Greco-Bactrian being the earlier one and the Indo-Greek being the latter one. Yeah. Why did they succeed for so long? What was it about these two? Uh, it's a very interesting question. You know, the, when Alexander died... Normally, the Indus Valley should have been the part of Seleucid Empire, I mean, founded right. by Seleucus. But the Indians were more powerful, like Chandragupta and his right. son, Ashoka. They conquered the region south of the Hindukush Mountains. But on the north of the Hindukush Mountains, Greek were, Greeks were there. So there are only two attempts by the Seleucids to conquer the power. First one was by Seleucus I. Second one was by Antiochus III. So right. when he came, he met that time, the, the Greeks, I mean, after Diodotus, they have revolted. So Euthydemus was in power. Euthydemus says, I didn't revolt against you, but I killed the king who revolted against you. So that means referring to Diodotus. So they yeah. had a discussion, and uh, uh, Antioch, uh, Euthydemus sent his son, Demetrius, and they had a conversation. And Antiochus said, OK, I agree. You can rule. You are independent. I <laughs> In marriage. So the recognition of the Seleucids of the Bactrian kingdom 
was very, very important. So they didn't have any enemies uh, from the West. So it's a very smooth transition then. It's a very smooth transition. There was no war. Of, of course, the Bactra, the capital of Bactria was sieged, but the siege ended, Antiochus III went back, and the Greeks were ruling. And on the southern part of the Hindukush Mountains, after the decline of the Marian Empire, Demetrius, uh, the king, the son of Euthydemus, crossed the, the Invincible. The Invincible, yeah. correct? The invincible, that's right, in the history yeah. of <laughs> yeah, Demetrius Kalinikos. And um, uh, so he was, um, he went there. And then they were there for, um, I mean, as I told you at the beginning, until about 1020 CE of the Common Era. So they didn't have, of course, later we'll talk about it, how we declined. But that right. period, on one side, the, the recognition by the Greeks, the Hellenistic kingdom of the Seleucids, as a legal uh, kingdom was a blessing for them. And on the other hand, there was no uh, really rivalry from the Indian side. They didn't face any power until, I mean, until the end. And of course, it's different. Well, I guess it would be a political vacuum existed that the Indians were not ready to fill because they were probably disconnected from what I'm understanding from the events taking place a little further south, correct? That's right, yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, I, I have to tell you, Demetrius the Invincible, or Nikitos, as we say in modern Greek, yeah. he's one of those amazing characters that on the coinage itself, and you'll talk about this very unique presentation of Demetrius very soon, um, he really is, he stands out. <laughs> That's how it, I mean, it's another way to, to answer your second question. I mean, how, I mean, he, he I mean, he's there in the, what we call the scalp of the elephant. That yes. Is, he's a symbol of India. Yes, I, that, I've never seen anything like that until that coin appeared before me, to have an actual elephant truck trunk extending from his crown. It, it really says a lot. It's quite unique to the region. So here's another question. Why is the study, I mean, I know you, you have filled in a lot of the gap, but before you filled in the gap, why was the study of this region, the Greco-Bactrian Indo-Greek region, so elusive. Why? Why? What were the, some source problems that? Uh, yeah, you may have... the same attitude. The, uh, if I may, the Greek, uh, real Greek historians of today, they have regarding the Central Asian Greeks. Yes. they are not very much interested. So it's the same thing in the in the past. Yes. The, I mean, like the great historians like Justine or Polybus or Strabo, they were not directly interested in the destiny. Uh, of the Greeks in these areas. If they talk about them, they only talk when they talk about the Parthians and the other other wars. So that's that's the problem. So, I mean, when we, um, as you know very well, Mike, when we write the Greek history or Roman history, we know even to the hour, the history of the, the emperors or the kings or uh, councils or whatever, because we have texts. When you write, right. Yeah. So when you write the story, the history of these Greeks, we don't have enough things. It's very That's sad. To give very sad. Example, uh, if you read the names on the coins, we have 45 Greek kings. Yes. And if you read the text, we have only eight kings mentioned. So this oh, is wow. reason, yeah, this is the reason why we call the history of the Greeks in Central Asia and India is a history of coins. That might have been quite an epiphany for you to discover 37 additional names. Yeah, exactly. And also I discovered another new name, I mean, two new names as well on the coins. So uh, the, fortunately for us on these coins, their names are given in genitive, I mean, like Basilius, Demetrius, I mean, uh, not uh, in the nominative case, but in, uh, it's the property of someone. So if you read them and we know the, uh, their names. So yeah. that's why uh, it's very important to know the, know the coins. That's a, and how is the quality in the coinage and, and, and the imagery of these kings as well? Uh, the, the quality is absolutely something. I mean, that's why people really like to collect these coins. Uh, at least the, the first kings of Bactria and also the Indo Greeks, they have their portrait on the obverse, beautiful portraits. And the reverse, I mean, it's, um, it's very interesting how, how they try to identify themselves with Alexander the Great. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, for example, if you take the first satrap of the Seleucid Empire who revolted against them called Diodotus, we know it's a God's gift 
I mean, right, the other, the other toss, right? Diagetus. So I mean, sorry about my pronunciation is different. Oh no, no, no! <laughs> I, I, I apologize for my modern Greek interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, uh, so he he has on his coinage on the on the reverse uh, the the thundering Zeus, the supreme god of the uh, right. Greek pantheon, and for his successor who was called Euthydemus. Uh, from the text of Polybus, we know he came from. Uh, um, um, uh, Magnesia of Mayon, um, uh, Anatolia, and yes. there um, the Heracles was the hero. So on this coinage, you have a Heracles on it, and it's not an accident because we know the relationship between Heracles or uh, Hercules and Alexander the Great. Yes. Alexander considered himself as the conqueror of India, and Heracles, uh, a hum I mean, normal mortal who became immortal. So they used the image of Heracles. As a symbol, because he is coming from uh, from the from Anatolia, and where Heracles was, um, I mean, very popular. So his son Demetrius, as you said very correctly, Mike. So he has this elephant scalp on the head, and on the reverse you have a standing Heracles crowning himself like Napoleon. Uh, <laughs> very, I mean, just to show that to the Indians, yes. I am your king. I mean, I can right. give you many many examples like that. For example, I mean, some kings are wearing the kosia, as you know, this is right. The Macedonian uh, hat, felt hat, yes. Uh, Alexander himself wore this, and you know the famous story yes. that uh, how the kosia, uh, I mean, fell and then it went to the muddy place, and one you saved it was, uh, you know, killed by <laughs> Alexander because he wore the diadem with the kosia. So it's it's quite uh, interesting story because how they try to um, try to identify. Themselves with the Alex with Alexander, perhaps the most important coin. If you give me one second, is sure. the, the twenty state coin, which is in the um, in the French cabinet of the National Library, which is the largest gold denomination ever struck in the world, even until today, which is about one hundred and seventy grams. And on the obverse, you have the portrait of the king with the horns and ears of uh, of Dan so it's wow. a reference. It's a reference to Dionysius, who was yes. to read um, Euripides, um, um, the theater, and we know that he he conquered India and he introduced wine to the Indians. So again, I mean, I can give you many examples. I think I will stop there. But this is <laughs> where you can see so many uh, of these Greek kings try to, I mean, uh, uh, to present themselves as the real successors of Alexander. So this well, is where the beauty. Professor, the beauty is not only uh, in, on the coinage, but it seems it's gone beyond. People are now looking to those coins uh, yeah. for suggestions to aesthetic. I, I'll be honest, I, a couple of days ago, my son, who's a, a big fan of this Hellenistic period, presented me an image of one of the Greco-Bactrian kings wearing the kafsia or the kausia. And it comes straight off the coins that uh, yeah. you've seen. And I didn't realize that what in, in, in Greece and in Macedonia is considered a simple farmer's hat has become a crown of authority. Exactly, it, yes. it tells you so much. And then, of course, the role of Heracles and Dionysus, as you yeah. very uh, uh, absolutely stated, uh, does seem to be a leading part of Alexander's quest to the East. That's uh, right. Absolutely. And it's great to see that in the Indian world uh, being uh, verified. Um, yeah. In terms of the... Um, the the cont continuity of this kind of coinage. How long did this quality in the currency uh, making? Uh, uh, how long did it continue until? It it continued until the very end. That means I mean normally uh, the straight or the third was the last. Uh, Greek straight or the third, yeah. right? Um, I mean, so that means somewhere around the ten twenty of the common era. So the the last three or four kings, the quality of the coins are not that good. But until right. the quality is absolutely wonderful. And also the one other remark is when you compare the Bactrian coins or Indo Greek coins with the Ptolemaic or the Seleucid coins, the Bactrian coins are so different. I mean, they are yes. so multiple multiple gods depicted. If you look at the Seleucid coins, you have Apollo seated on the Amphalaos, the, the center of the world. But here you have the gods identifying themselves with Athena, and also with, uh, with Heracles, with Dionysus, with, with Poseidon, so many gods, almost except Aphrodite, the Venus. Right. All the other gods are depicted on the coin. So they are wow. very, very different. 
Right, right. The Olympian uh, gods in their fullest creation. I did see that amazing coin, that large golden coin. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the one with the chariot, right? And there's like a symbol. There's a god in one of them with, with like almost like Helios with the rays extending out of his head. Is that the one? No, this is the no, no. Uh, this is the coin of Eucratides. He has his helmet. On the helmet, you have the horns and the ears. And on the rears, you have the Dioscuri. Oh, uh, okay, the Dioscuri, uh, wow. The Castor and Pollux on it. Yeah. And, uh, so they are riding, and also, you know, they gain the relationship with one of them, is the son of Zeus, the Supreme right. Lord. So it's always, I mean, if you look at the coins, there's always a reference to. Um, uh, a reference to uh, uh, to the Greek gods, Greek pantheon. That says a lot. And how does the native population feel about the um, these cultural changes? Uh, I think they accept it because I mean, uh, the reason why I say they were accepted uh, is you can't imagine the number of coins that you find in these reeds. I don't know whether you heard about my work on Mirsaka, which was a deposit which contained four tons of coins. And out of four tons, there are at least two tons of Greek coins in it. And also, every day we find a new treasure, a new hole. Wow. Thousands and thousands of coins. And also, it's not the number and the number of dies, you know, with the obvious die, you can mint about 20,000 coins. So, can you imagine the number of production? That means the native accepted that. And the other thing is that they, the, the, I mean, of course, they can read the name of the king because it's written in their own language, not only in Greek. Uh, so right. it's, uh, it's quite interesting. There was a demand. I mean, just to give you an example, these coins were in circulation until the 19th century because right. you get the old strikes of these coins. I mean, not that they knew anything about the Greeks who ruled there, but the quality of the silver and the quality of the gold is so good. I mean, sometimes we did the analysis of the silver. It's quite pure silver. It's about 95%. And the gold is about 98% pure. That, that is very high level. Very yeah. high level of purity. So even the, the, I mean, people can't remember the king who issued them, but they respected the quality of the coins because they are of good silver and good gold. That is, so it says a lot about the quality, yeah. That, exactly. And uh, am I correct in assuming that you went through those two tons of coins to take a look at them? That's a yes, lot of work. I did. Oh, I did, I oh, did wow. mean something very rapidly. It's a long story. We should. <laughs> I mean, but there were really four tons of coins. You know, where, that's that's yeah, a lot. So that is really, amazing to find that. Yeah. Wow. And and since we're talking about the appearance of the Greek language on the coins, um, how did the linguistic issue? Was there a linguistic issue between the government and the governed there? Did you find any um, acceptance of Greek among the locals? Uh, I mean, was this like the new lingua franca, as you said before, for yeah. this time period? Uh, I think the, the the good thing about it is that you have the Greek religion and the uh, the Karoshi or the Brahmi, which is we call the Gandhari on the rivers. So they knew, I mean, they respected their language. And also, Mike, I think towards the end, they all became Buddhist or Hindus. I mean, we right. have absolute evidence. Um, there is a person called Heliodorus, and there's an inscription in right in the middle of India called Vesnagar in Vidisha. He says he is the ambassador of the Greek king called Antiochus, who was ruling in Taxila, and he said, "I'm right, you know, and I became a Hindu. I am, a, I am a Bhagavat." Bhagavad Gita. That means he is believing in Vishnu. Oh. So this is one one example. Uh, and also, I give you another one in this recent book that you kindly mentioned. Um, I have published a new stupa, you know, this Buddhist monument, and there are three names on this, and one is Greek, is Soilus. On the stupa. Even on the stupa, and you have oh. one is a Scythian, one is Indian, other one is a, other one is a Greek. So that means most of these Greeks were, I mean, they they mixed up with the local community. I mean, towards the end, and they became Buddhist or Hindu, and they. That's why I'm, I I don't know whether we will have time, Mike. But if we talk about the Gandhara art, we can see this yes. inspiration of the Greek art on them. If we can, well, yeah, I would love to go back and explain also the the significance of the stupa because that's something I think many people are not aware of. Um, yeah. 
I think that leads me to the next question and, and talk about the the cultural exchange between the Greek world and the Indian world in terms of religion. And we know for a fact that Alexander the Great had in his immediate circle an amazing Jainist, uh, I would assume he was a Jainist priest uh, who was given the Greek name Kalanos. Yes. Since that time, the fascination of the Greek world with the Indian world um, has continued into the reign of the very special king, Menander the First Sotir, or the savior, who yeah. is known as Melinda to the native Indians. Can you explain about this important personality? It's quite interesting. I mean, he's known as Melinda uh, in the in the uh, Pali and Chinese texts. So we believe it is Menander. And, you know, he was the biggest indo Greek king of the whole dynasty because he has so many coins and so many types and he's also mentioned in the greek text i'll come to that so in the unfortunately the original text is lost which was in sanskrit but we have got two translations one is chinese and the other one is pali i mean you believe it or not uh, one of the reasons why i come from sri lanka it was found in sri lanka the pali translation oh. so in, the, in the pali translation what we call the Milinda Panya. At the end, he become a Buddhist, right? right? But in the Chinese text, he doesn't become a Buddhist. But he says he died in the in the battlefield. I mean, the, uh, this is coming from um, um, uh, coming from Polybus saying that he uh, sorry from from Pluto. Um, I mean, this what when a certain man named Menander, who had been a good king of Bactrians, died in camp, and the city celebrated his funeral as usual in other respects. But in respect of his remains, they put uh, forth rival claims and only with difficulty came in terms agreeing that they should divide the ashes. So this is very interesting, ah. because when ah. people pass away, the cities fought to get, get, uh, to get the ashes. The for remains, the ashes? Yeah, for the ashes, <laughs> and they wow. built the stupas. And that the, is something. The same story, I mean, it is not written by an Indian, but it's Plutarch. Who is a, yes. serious, uh, a serious historian? Very of the I mean, Christian. I mean, beginning of the Christian era. Right. And in days, he was so so well as, uh, uh, accepted by the community. They wanted his that. That means they also made stupas or some sort of a monument in his honor. So even if he didn't become a Buddhist, but he really, um, I mean, the the Buddhists took refuge in his kingdom because that was a period the Sindh Empire was rising and it was a Hindu empire. So they came to Gandhara and the uh, region where Gandhara was powerful. And uh, I mean, sometime later, 100 years later, we are the Gandhara Nath was born. So Melinda is very interesting. And, uh, very. Yeah. And if you read the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dialogue between uh, Nagasena, the Buddhist monk, and the, and the Greek king Melinda, it's almost a platonic discussion. Wow. For those of you just joined us, we have Professor Asim Bapariachi here on the Musical Masterwork Special Edition. We just talked about this very important uh, personality, Menander the First Sotir, uh, also known as Melinda. And, and you, 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 you've, you specified that the Chinese version is a bit different from the Indian version. Is there any kind of a motivation for oh, not yes. mentioning that? Yeah, the, I think the people believe the Chinese version is the true translation of the oh. Sanskrit text, which is lost. The Pali version, which was found in Sri Lanka or Ceylon, uh, they have, there are two parts. The first part is the real translation of the Sanskrit text. And the second part is was added in the 5th century by the Buddhist monks of Sri Lanka. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's the that later introduction. Yeah, so I wrote a I mean, long paper on that, I mean, to prove, I mean, there's no reason to believe that he became a Buddhist. Uh, uh. I mean, he stayed as a Greek and he died in, in the battlefield, but he was a good king. He was yes. a good king, that's why people liked him. And if people fight for your ash, when I, I'm, I'm <laughs> Oh, nobody's going to fight for our ash. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's not get that dark now, Professor. <laughs> Fighting for the ashes of this poor man. And I guess they, it ended up in a stupa somewhere, right? That's right, exactly. So they don't say exactly, but you know, it's, yeah. there's another description in a Pali text, I mean, origin, origin from Sri Lanka called Diganikai, it explains exactly the same thing. When Buddha wow. passed away, he was cremated, the body was cremated, and eight kingdoms fought against the uh, Kusina 
Nagara, the, the place where he died, asking for ash. And they took the ash and they built up stupas. So it's a very interesting, it's not that innocent when you say that the conversation with Nagasena, the Buddhist monk and Menanda giving uh, refuge to the Buddhist. So it's something, I mean, again, to answer your question, this is where you see how the Greeks knew to be good to the local people. Yes, that's a big <laughs> statement. Yes, yes to, get, yeah. to be aware of their interests and their needs. One more mm -hmm. thing, Professor, before I um, go to the next question. I noticed on the coin of Menander that he wears the royal band around his head, yeah. the ribbon. Yeah. And, and is that something unique to him on the coinage, or is that something you find on many of the um, kings uh, that you found? Uh, you find on, on all the Bactrian coins. Okay. Actually. The diadem, which was I mean, almost purple color, which, yes. uh, and the, uh, Alexander was wearing that, and it came right. from the Persians, very curious. The Persians had this band called oh, the, the Persians. Yeah. yeah. And, and so this became the, the one who had the diadem was the king. Right. All these people didn't have the right to wear it. Professor, um, having talked about the importance of Greek culture uh, on the region itself, I, I'd like to know um, what was the influence on the aesthetic transition that is, is called Gandharan art? Um, and from your achievement in the, uh, in, in the studies um, and your uh, archaeological finds, how how credible it was this transformation that it affected everything? Yeah, I mean, people have written about it. The French uh, scholar called Alfred Fouché is the one who really called the Gandhara not Greek or Buddhist art. Greek or right. Buddhist art. The uh, reason is there are so many Greek motives uh, in the Gandhara art. So let me summarize it very briefly. The yes. Greek power came to an end somewhere around the 20th uh, of the common era. And then immediately, uh, I mean, there were Indusidians and Indo-Parthians, and the Kushans came to power. The Kushans, beginning right. of the, uh, the Kushan Empire, I mean, the Kanishka, it is 127. So this is the period where Gandharan, uh, Gandharan art really was born. So we need oh. uh, some sort of a reminiscence of the Greek art. The reason mm -hmm. there are many, many ways to analyze it. We need hours and hours, but I'll be very brief about it. The first thing is the depiction of the, the Buddha uh, in an anthropomorphic way, that means in a human body. Uh, with a, until then, in the Indian art, he was never represented in a human form. So only by symbols like the throne or the sacred Bodhi tree or the footprints. So the, with the, for the Greeks to represent their gods in human form was not, a, uh, was not a problem. I mean, we have Zeus, we have Aphrodite, we have everyone in human form. So this is the way how the, the Buddha, to some say it's directly coming. They, they took Apollo, the most beautiful god in, uh, in the Greek mythology, and uh, depicted Buddha. So apart from that, and also the narrations, the way the story of the Buddha is narrated, so you have seen by scene, the, from the birth to uh, until his death and also the distribution of his relics. So the scenes are divided by, by the Corinthian, I mean, by the columns uh, surmounted by Corinthian capitals, right? So yes. that's one thing. And again, for example, we were talking about Heracli, he, he was very popular and he was integrated into the Gandharan Buddhist art as we call him Vajrapani, the one who has the Vajra or the thunderbolt. Uh, yes. The, right? The Heracles, yes. Heracles should have a club. But here, there are some depictions where he has both the club and the thunderbolt. But yes. in modern art, he is absolutely like Heracles, um, like, uh, like Heracles in the Hellenistic art. But he is there to protect the Buddha. But when you look at the other forms of Pami, there were the Buddhist, Buddhist art, like in Mathura, Sanchi, and Andhra, you don't get Heracles. You don't get Pami. Yes. Only Why would that be? Uh, because of the, 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 again, the inspiration of the, in that period, the Greeks were still there, although they were not dominated, I mean, they were not ruling, but the Greeks right. were there and they have a connections with Greek. So they thought he is wonderful. And he is not the only one. And also, for example, this uh, city goddess, you know, the Taiki, was and his iconography holding the cornucopia, the, the, the right. of abundance. And it is applied to Hariki, who is a 
Buddhist goddess. The Hari Thieves was a Yaksha. Yaksha means some sort of a demoniac yeah. spirit who, who had thousand kids and he killed other humans to feed his uh, her children. So, uh -huh. so people go, went and complained to Buddha, why, I mean, if she is killing our children. So what Buddha did was took the youngest one and hid him in his bowl. And she was, she went crazy and looking after the, the child and the Buddha and said, I lost my youngest. And Buddha said, you have 999 children yeah. and you are only one is missing, but you kill the unique children of the other people. So she became a wonderful person and she became some sort of a mother goddess. Now, to, I mean, I told the story is very important because to depict this personality, this important the the demon who became a protector of children, they took a tanky, the city goddess, and and with a cornucopia. So the the inspiration is absolutely great, but the story right. is Indian. So I mean, right. same thing, same thing with Dionysus. If you look at some of the stupas, you have the, the scenes how to make wine because in Bactria they 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 had wine. I mean grape wine. So they cultivate grapes. They have the fermentation. I mean. The trampling of the wine, fermentation, drinking, having, uh, uh, I mean, luxurious life. So even these things were in the art. So it's very interesting combination yes. of explaining yes. to the Greeks. The, I mean, newly converted to Buddhism. I mean, there is something called notion of paradise in between. So it's a, it's a very nice. I mean, Gandharan art is a very nice way of uh, pointing to the fact the. Uh, the, since the Greeks were there for more than 300 years, their art, I mean, you have Greek sculptures and other things, it remained. Yes. Which is not the case with the other schools of Buddhist art. In that says a lot. That says a lot that the appreciation for the Greek tradition there was so strong that it lasted. And, and I'll be honest, I've seen those uh, beautiful uh, pieces that you presented on the stupas. And it's in some ways, they, they, they seem to have a, a quality that I find in late Roman um, uh, marbles uh, statuary and um, where you have these intricate scenes of many personalities. And there in one little corner, sitting down with the club and a lightning bolt is Hercules or Heracles. Yeah. Uh, it, it really says a lot about yeah. the cultural diffusion that took place. I do have one question before we go to the break. Yeah. Is Indian, are Indians interested still in winemaking? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> yes, I mean, now, India, I mean, they have started producing good wine uh, in our primary places. I have... I have had, I mean, I'm, I love wine and I had those wines, it's not come up that bad. But the tradition continued in Bactria in Afghanistan. They still cultivate, uh, in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, they still cultivate uh, uh, grapes. Uh, I mean, in Afghanistan, of course, you can't you can have alcohol, but in Uzbekistan, you know, people uh, distill alcohol and they, I mean, of course, the fermentation of wine. So they still make wine. Even though there may be religious prohibitions in some cases, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yes, but, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great. That, that's another legacy of Alexander, right there. The, the, the winemaking. It, it's, it's it's a great story. And welcome back to Musical Masterworks for our final portion of the night, a fascinating conversation with Professor Osman Bapariarachi, who has talked about the amazing legacy of Alexander the Great in the region. We've talked about the political and social and cultural aspects as well as some of the linguistic and religious aspects. Professor, what, what else can we say about this legacy of Alexander the Great in the region? Not to be said, you know, the, the, the fundamental question about Alexander is that at the, uh, the region where he was, I mean, really, who, I mean, it is today's Pakistan. He never went to today's India. But those days it was the India. I mean, any region south of the Indo-Kush Mountains considered as part of India, although right. the geographic things shifted. But if you look at the the people, some people say, um, you, I'm sure you have heard about this, and they claim that they are the descendants of Alexander. Yes, um, yes, the Kalash. The Kalash, the slopes of uh, Hima, um, uh, Himalaya. I don't know how far this is true or not. But the, And also the name like uh, Sikandar which right. is the name for Alexander. And also a number of movies made of Alexander. It's very interesting. 
um, on the other day I was invited to give a talk and then uh, before the talk they showed this movie which I haven't seen made in 1950s about yeah. black and white uh, black and white movie on Alexander the Great you can criticize about the way how the things are made you know they I mean Alexander wears almost a mogul and uh, not not the Macedonian uh, <laughs> press but, right. but the, the, this is interesting question again a foreigner coming to India and conquering India and going back and his legacy continued for years and years and years. So yes. in daily life, you look at certain things, as I said, the, the bilingual coinage, the dry start coinage, even theater, uh, so, many, so much is left in these places, especially in Pakistan. Um, you can't avoid it. You can't, you can't just, just say, no, I, am, I want to ignore it. No, especially in, uh, especially in Afghanistan, you may have heard about the uh, Jalalabad Hatta, those sculptures are so realistic. Uh, the famous archaeologist and artist for John Broadman said they are as beautiful as the Greek classical art. So that's that's something which is absolutely interesting uh, to, to realize. So the legacy continues in uh, in India um, in uh, in different ways. So people can, I mean, of course, like history, I mean, things get uh, deformed and things are added. But uh, the, um, the, uh, the Alexander is known. I mean, I think everybody would know about Alexander and his conquest um, uh, of Indian territories. But Professor, you would agree with me in saying that while Alexander was that amazing personality that left a name for a short period of time, it really was the hard work of the successor states, the great kings of the back Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek kingdom that made the difference, right? Absolutely, yes. I mean, he was <laughs> three years. And um, as you know, I mean, he died very young. And so, uh, he, he, the, you know, this interesting thing is, Mike, that uh, uh, Alexander almost continued the academic way of go uh, governing, that means have satraps. So he put right. citizens and small armies. And he, you know, for example, when he had the battle with Boris, the Indian king on the elephants with 250 elephants. Uh, Porus was defeated, but he gave the kingdom to Porus. Yes, yes, the respect he had for him. That's correct. And also the same thing with Ambi or the Taxila, the, the prince of Taxila. Yes, and gave Ambi. the kingdom to him and went away. So the, the, it, it is there. I mean, so the, that type of uh, um, uh, shrewd way of doing it um, uh, to, to govern, the, govern the country. but. It, it is not enough. And if these satraps didn't take power, especially Diodorus, if he didn't take power and created the greco bactrian kingdom, the discussion we had today would have been uh, in the, I mean, we can't talk about it because it must That's be. right. So it's, a, it's a, as you very correctly said, it's thanks to those, I mean, 40 odd kings who really ruled in the regions, who knew how to govern with the local population. It is not easy. On the north of the Hindukush, people were more Greek oriented. South of the Hindukush, they didn't know any Greek. They had their own local language, but still they could rule there for 200 years. Yes. So it should be. And yeah. And thanks to you, Professor, those successors, those great kings, those 45 kings that you've uncovered have gotten their great moment. Yeah. And it's uh, a, a big thank you to you for everything you've done. Uh, is there anything uh, you've got planned in the future? Uh, in, in yeah, we are planning to have an um, uh, exhibition on Gandharan art uh, in Berkeley Museum. Uh, it was yes. October, but because of the new situation, we had to postpone it until April 29th. It will be followed by talks and also a colloquium, what we call a conference, with right. the world experts on Gandharan art. Uh, so it will go on for two days and it's open access. Uh, the exhibition will go on for three months or even more. Um, uh, so it, it will start on April 29th. It will be a good occasion to see some of the uh, wonderful masterpieces of Gandharan art. And that sounds like a wonderful experience. And, and so once again, April 29th, 2021 at Berkeley in California. Anybody interested, we could always give you information. Professor, I want to thank you for, first of all, you're connecting with us in Paris, beautiful Paris. I hope you have a wonderful day there. A big thank you for everything you shared with us. And uh, we look forward to having you again, hopefully in person. 
Yes, absolutely. It's, a, it's my pleasure, Mike. Thank you very much. I thank all. Thank of you. you so much, Professor. Thank you so much for uh, enlightening us on this very fascinating topic. And as we've come to the end of tonight's program, I wanted to provide a little epilogue, as we usually do, by bringing uh, Esmeralda Maricas into the conversation. Are you here, Esmeralda? I'm here, Mike. I'm here. And we have to express our gratitude to Mrs. Grigoraku, who made this unique and incredible interview possible. And at the same time, I enjoyed the professor's presentation, and I think he would agree with me in recalling the famous quote of the French author Jean Richepin, Greece cannot be extinguished. <laughs> well said. Well said. Well said. So thank you so much, Esmeralda. And you have thank been you listening too, to a musical masterwork special edition here tonight and with our special distinguished guest, Professor Osman Bopiarachi. If you need more information, please give us a call, 718-204-8900. I'll be back again in two weeks. And until that time, have a wonderful night.